Turn with me in your scriptures to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16, and beginning then in verse 24. And uh, I have the ESV translation uh, in front of me here. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? As we look at this passage, we encounter a interesting translation phenomenon in that we have the same Greek word used repeatedly, but in the first uh, instances, it's translated as life, and in the last two instances, as soul. But it is uh, in verse 25 and 26, it is, in each instance, the Greek word suke, suke. The reason for this awkwardness is in part that when English translates the New Testament, we tend to use the word soul for the Greek word suke and the word spirit for the Greek word pneuma. But in fact, those are almost reversed in value. We think of spirit as the spirit of a man, a spirit of love, what have you. And we tend to use the word soul for the notion of the immortal soul, the, the, the immaterial existing part of man. Uh, Greek is just the reverse of that. It uses suke for life force and pneuma for uh, the existing part of man. So we can better translate this text. Then Jesus said to us, if anyone would come after him, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his soul life will lose it. But whoever loses his soul life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? soul life? Or shall a man, or what shall a man give in return for his soul life? I've used that same expression, soul life, in all those instances to show you that's the same word in Greek. You see, God made us to know him. That's why he made us according to his image and according to his likeness. It is of the essence of our humanity that we should know and love our Creator. But because our first father and we following him have turned away from the one true God, we find that we do not know God apart from his grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the biggest obstacle to our knowing God is ourselves. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. N not deny creaturely pleasures like food and, and clothing. Uh, uh, not that sort of stuff that developed into monasticism. But rather to deny ourselves, that is to say, our own sense of our own goodness, of our self-sufficiency, of our adequacy. so that we might turn to Christ and find him. We spend a lot of our lives finding our lives, seeking our lives in all sorts of things that are, in the providence of God, good things. But we can so pursue all of the good things of life that we 
lose our life in the process of finding our life. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul life? The interpretation of the biblical text involves careful language study. I've just done some of that with you. You're used to me doing that. If Professor Williams was up here, it would be the same thing, except he would use that language that reads the wrong direction. <laughs> Part of the interpretation of scripture is only possible with that regenerating work of the spirit in which our minds are renewed and enlightened and we're able to understand the truth of God believingly. And we all are here as those who profess to have been born of the spirit and to receive the scripture as the word of God. But part of the interpretation of scripture is the experience of the providence of God that puts us in a place where words that have clear and distinct meaning objectively in the sense that one can explain them have a new and profound meaning because they speak to where one is in life. I dreamed of certain things, a little farm, a retirement there. I was in excellent health. I had solved my weight problem. And I was delighting in all the good things that I was anticipating. And then there was the cancer and the surgery, and the long, difficult chemotherapy, and the recovery, and the good news that there was no cancer in me. And then the second cancer, and the more radical surgery, and the long and difficult recovery. And the return of strength, getting the tractor out, plowing the garden, planning the future. And then the third cancer, and now the chemo to treat that cancer. What does it profit a man? if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul life. I had read that text so many times in the Greek. I had looked at it, analyzed it, considered its grammar, researched the words behind it. But I never felt that text like I felt at the end of this summer, when for the third time I was crushed with a diagnosis of cancer. And I realized the extent to which enjoying the providence of God, the good gifts of God in this life, that the thought of losing those to cancer, my wife, my daughter and grandson, my little farm, my friendships and joys, all of that might be gone. Only to realize that all of those things, as wonderful as they are, and as much as I ask the Lord to preserve them for me, 
If I have all of those things, what have I gained if I forfeit my soul life? For what is most important but to know the living God and to dwell in his tents forever? Young folks, because I'm an old guy that makes all of you, except for one or two young folks, in the midst of life in this world, in the joys and struggles, in the hopes and dreams and plans of this life, never forget that the only thing that matters is beyond this life. Everything here passes away. But if I come to Jesus, losing myself for him, when I find him, then I find life that persists through death forever. To lose your life for the sake of Jesus is for most of us not to be a martyr as we use the term. It is not to be imprisoned or uh, executed for the faith, although that does occur. It is to take our dreams, our hopes, our expectations, what we think will make us happy, good, at peace. And lose all of those and say, yes, but if I have Jesus, it's all good. If it's all gone tomorrow, if the cancer is back, and there is no remedy for it this time. I have Jesus. And if I have Jesus, <clears throat> whatever I may have lost in the few years of this life that may have been cut short, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As you minister to people in the church, remember that beyond getting them to think correct theology, and that's an important thing to do, beyond helping them understand difficult passages, and that's important to do, beyond helping them wrestle through the struggles of life, the tensions of marriage, the struggles of being parent, difficulties in the workplace, and all of those things. As you do all of those things, remember you're aiming at one goal, and that is that that person, denying themselves, losing their life for the sake of Jesus, would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Everything in this life passes away. But life in Jesus is forever. Don't lose sight of that center in your ministry. Because you will find people who, whether young or old, are facing the imminent end of this life. And all of the things that seem so important to you in the midst of ministry mean nothing when you stare death in the face. But what matters is that if I lose my life for Christ's sake, then will I find my life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to look honestly at ourselves, to see how we can be so consumed with ourselves and all that we have and do, 
we lose sight of you and your son, Jesus, and draw us this day and every day to receive and rest upon your son as our perfect and all-sufficient Savior, and to delight and rejoice that we have assurance that we shall live in your presence forever. Whether the days of this life be many or few, they will count nothing against that eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please turn with me in your Psalter to Psalm 27 and Selection B, Psalm 27B. Psalm 27B. 